And then I went into the um, kind of the private sector uh, for quite a while doing specifically audio and visual archiving uh, of physical collections as well as the, the digitization and preservation of them, video, audio. Um, and then finally got to the corporate side with the Campbell Soup Company. So that was in 2010. My first day, actually, my orientation day and my first effective date was the same day my uh, twins were born. So that was kind of crazy. I was sitting in the, the lobby waiting, you know, to go into this big Fortune 500 company as a little, you know, 20 something year old East Texas kid, you know, shaking in his boots. Um, and then I get a call. It says, the doctor said you better get up here quick because we've got an emergency C section. Your babies are coming. Um, so I walked up to the desk and said, uh, Excuse me, I. I have to leave because uh, my kids are being born. And is that okay? And they're like, yeah, go, that's fine. And I thought they were going to tell me to not come back. You know, that's kind of how naive I was. Um, so that was a great run there. Um, taught me a lot. Um, and then ultimately ended up here uh, with the Cowboys. So I was, at, if you're curious, I was sitting in a meeting. It was a, a brand and advertising meeting um, where a friend of mine in PR at Campbell's came up and said, aren't you from Dallas or something or from Texas? And I was like, yeah. She said, aren't you, are you a Cowboys fan? I said, I am. She said, I didn't want to tell you this because we don't want you to go anywhere, but they're actually hiring an archivist. And I was like, oh, that's cool. It's about time, you know. And uh, I actually forgot about it. didn't even think about it for about two weeks because I was really happy where I was. And, you know, thinking about moving four kids across the country is kind of, a, you know, kind of crazy. Uh, my wife said, you know what, you'll never forgive yourself if you don't at least apply. So I did and got a call like a week later and, and now I'm here. Um, so that's how I ended up here. And I guess we'll just jump in enough about me, just to let you know kind of where I came from and why I'm doing what I'm doing and, and why they brought me on board here. Uh, so we'll start with a little bit of uh, background if I can get this to work. There we go. Uh, on the archives, I do have quite a few little transitions, so I'm going to probably have to make this clicker work somehow. Um, got 57 years of very rich heritage. You can call it 58 if you want to go back to October, November of 1959 when they were hiring Tech Schramm as general manager and all that stuff. We've had three stadiums thousands of players. We've got 16 NFL Hall of Famers now uh, with Mr. Jones um, going in. And if you add up all the players in the Hall of Fame that have had some tie or played for the Cowboys at one time or another, it's 24. Uh, we've got five Super Bowl wins, iconic coaches and executives, Gil Brandt, Tom Landry, Tech Schramm, um, Jerry Jones, all these people. Um, Decades and decades of merchandise, and then 40 years of publication. So we, for quite a while, we've been doing our own uh, game programs, but we've had the Dallas Cowboys official weekly and Star Magazine since 1975. So we've got a lot of uh, magazine issues. Um, and then 57 seasons of games played. It's quite a bit. So through all that, you collect a lot of stuff. We've been building this from the ground up. It really was a, uh, we've been told we need to do something. We don't really know. We know we want to do something. Can you tell us what to do and, and come do it? I was like, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so the first uh, formal archivist and formal archiving initiative with the NFL franchise <clears throat> charged with being responsible for our history and our heritage um, and all that. I mean, that's a, a broad statement. Um, but the Jones family is really the impetus for it. Um, Mr. Jones, Mr. Jerry Jones, um, I got to credit him with everything for why I'm here because he is very nostalgic, very um, in tune with our history and very uh, into preserving it and protecting it uh, and being the custodians as the franchise and as the family that owns this franchise, they are de facto the keepers of Dallas Cowboys history. Um, they really get that and he, so when he came in after purchasing the team in 1989, kept everything. And he's kept everything for all of his tenure. So it was great when I came in to go, 
you know, you're only as good as your collections. You know, you come in, you've got everything, <clears throat> more or less. Now, the state that all that was in and where it was and how it was stored and, and you know, a lack of inventorying uh, made it pretty difficult and it was going to present a lot of challenges. But we started by, yes, we have, you know, our history. We have the artifacts that tell our story. Uh, so that was really, um, really awesome because when I got here, I really didn't know. I mean, I've been told different things, um, but I really didn't know what you had. Um, and some of the impetus for hiring an, an archivist was that they had had a big um, group come in to do some collection assessments on their, primarily their moving image stuff, film and video, because uh, as we all know, it's kind of a race against time as some of these formats start to break down, um, and you don't want to lose all your stuff. So they brought them in, they went through and kind of saw the breadth of what they had, formats, how much, uh, the age of it, and kind of put together um, some recommendations. And the first thing they recommended was you need to bring somebody in here and get their arms around all this and, and start sorting it out. Obviously, they wanted the business and they kind of wanted to do it also. They were hoping I would come in and say, yeah, let's let them come in and do it all. But I said, no, we're going to do it the right way um, and try to, try to insulate ourselves a little bit from from that uh, business side of, you know, doing it for the money and, and, and maybe cutting some corners and not getting everything done or, or neglecting that, hey, you, you did all this film and video work, but you forgot about, what about all the paper, you know, all the other important things that we have, so. So where we're at, I came in in 2014 was, and it's still a lot of ongoing discovery, but it's a lot of, hey, what do we have, where is it? How much of there is it? Um, so determining the variety of, of quote unquote archival assets that we had and discovering the variety and uniqueness of content. You know, is it like, is it all jerseys and footballs or, or do we have other stuff too? You know, do we have uh, business records? Do we have personnel records? Do we have medical records? Do we have, um, you know, bumper stickers? You know, what all do we have? Um, so what we found was we kind of have a little bit of all of it. We started aggregating and centralizing these assets. They were spread out, a bunch of on-site and off-site facilities um, all over the Metroplex. Um, so we had, when I came in, a centralized space that they had built um, with their knowledge for holding all of these assets. So uh, we ended up with a having a secured, very secured, uh, climate controlled and dedicated um, library, basically our own stacks area, uh, which was great. We didn't have to try to talk them into building something right off the bat. Down here, just a few photos. I want to try to put as many visual images in here because you can sit here and listen to me talk all day, but that's probably kind of boring. Um, I want to have, have some things for you to to, to look at that maybe you've never seen before. So here on the left is we've got six of the original uh, practice facility lockers from the, our old Forest Lane facility that we used from 1960 through 85. And a little known fact is these lockers actually came to Valley Ranch when they first opened in 1985 because they didn't have the lockers for Valley Ranch yet. Um, and then we were cleaning out Valley Ranch with our move to the Star in Frisco. We actually found a few more of these, which is really cool because they're very rare. Um, they've held up very well uh, over the years. And then on the right is a uh, Dallas Cowboys 1960 preseason media packet. We used to call it the preseason prospectus for decades. Um, that's pretty cool seeing that. When you see Cowboy Joe, that was our first logo um, that we had. And actually on display at the Star, we have uh, the original first hand-drawn artwork of Cowboy Joe, which is pretty neat. So continuing on that, the next step is, you know, we got to organize, catalog, inventory, all this stuff. Um, so I use the word stuff a lot because it's just so much, I don't even know what to say. You know, it's like, it's just a lot of stuff. It's all very, very important. Uh, I don't like the word stuff to make it sound like it's, it's less important because that's not true. But you'll probably hear that word a lot, and I apologize. Um, so we started conducting the first inventories and catalogs. Um, actually organizing and arranging materials, 
getting them all moved from here and there into a centralized location. Um, and then, you know, when early on starting to prepare uh, and conducting large scale digitization projects, so kind of doing that in phase work. So I tell people that work for me all the time and interns I've had in the past, like, in this kind of work, you have to do everything all at the same time, all the time. Uh, and it sounds insurmountable, but you can't just say, we're going to catalog everything, or we're going to you know, centri you know, centralize it all, then we're going to catalog it all, then we're going to uh, you know, send it out to be digitized or whatever, and, and then we're going to do this. You, you, you kind of got to be working on it all the time, or, or you'll never get there, um, especially when you run lean on manpower and uh, have a lot of items to deal with. So we start actually organizing these materials. We start um, physical organizing, find out what we have, um, seeing what fits up into intellectual units, like our film and video collections, um, trying, to, trying to figure out how we're going to arrange this stuff, um, determining estimations, like how much film do we have? How much have we not found yet? Um, those are some big questions. As you go into one area, it's like, all right, there's like 14 pallets of tape. Um, you know, is there another room with 14 pallets somewhere that I don't know about? Uh, it's really hard to get any answers because nobody really knew. Uh, although a lot of people that work with us have been there for many, many, many years. Uh, but, you know, you start to forget or, or you thought this stuff got tossed but it didn't or you thought somebody else had it. Or, uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of questions to answer on, on the breadth of, of what we had. Um, and then digital asset management. So when I got there, um, our IT folks, our IT systems, you know, everything's great. It's real top of the line, state of the art. People do great work there. What nobody really understood over the years is, and this is part of in the corporate archiving world especially, you're paid to clean up messes. You're paid to retroactively clean it up, capture everything you're doing today because tomorrow's history, and yesterday will be history, and then build in the infrastructure and, and the workflows to figure out how do we prevent those messes from happening in the future, capture everything, and make it all a smooth, well-oiled machine. What people weren't understanding is they're getting paid for today. You design a graphic, you know, 10 years ago, you burn it off onto a DVD-ROM, set it on your desk somewhere, and then they get let go, and then the next person comes in, and it gets thrown in a a dumpster, they haul it off off-site storage somewhere and it's just got a sharpie on it that says like, you know, red and white soup labeled version 800,000 2014, you know, like, that tells you nothing, there's no metadata, there's no, you know, it's like, okay, great, I'm glad we have it, but I don't know, it's going to take forever to figure all this out. Um, so, nobody, with all the digital asset tools that we had and storage that we had, none of it was organized. It was all departmentalized, um, all intuitive, folder nests, just, you know, 2016 game shots thrown in a folder, whatever it was. Uh, so we had to go in and, and implement an enterprise digital asset management systems for all of, all of our, you know, stuff that was already born digital that we had all over the place. So we're like finding all this physical stuff everywhere, and then we're finding all the born digital stuff everywhere, and we got to physically organize and arrange and catalog and inventory and, and then do the same with all the, the digital side, and then figure out, you know, I came in in 2014 in like May, June, so I was a little bit lucky that training camp hadn't even started, so I had like a month or so to figure out how can we work with our photographers and content generators to come up with a uniform system of dates, file names, embedded metadata, where's it going to go, how's it going to get organized until we can bring some systems online. Let's see, I'm going to make it work. There we go. So our collections, we've kind of been going through it already, but you know, the, the standard big buckets, we had a bunch of born digital, a bunch of physical, and a bunch of digitized stuff. Um, here, um, wait a minute. I skipped it. There we go. Um, so here, just just to show you a couple of things. So we have, we you the the thing I've always loved about corporate archiving is I felt like every single day you make a difference, a big difference. 
When I was at Campbell's, we did so much intellectual property work, defending our trademarks and copyrights all over the world, it was, it was insane. And uh, most times we were the only department that could provide what they needed um, to prove what they needed to prove in the U.S., in China, in India, all kinds of, of things like that. Um, here we generate a lot of content and we make a big difference on a daily basis um, providing assets for content. So like on DallasCowboys.com, we have the Legends show that's been going on for uh, since the mid-90s sometime. Uh, this one's on Cliff Harris. So they call me up like, hey, we're doing a Legends show on Cliff Harris. Give us some stuff on Cliff Harris. I'm like, well, what do you want? Like everything, whatever you got. So, you know, his draft evaluation reports, photos, um, you know, any and everything we find, news clippings, media clippings, uh, for them to, to add into this. Um, and oftentimes they don't know the history well enough. Everybody knows, or most fans would know who Cliff Harris is, but they may not know enough about him to even know what to look for or what things are unique or tell a story that the, the public and fans would really enjoy hearing about. Um, and then on the side here is kind of neat. So this is Jim Garrett's 1988 scouting report on Troy Aikman. So Jim Garrett is our head coach, Jason Garrett's father. And he started scouting for us uh, with a third party company in the 60s uh, for quite a while and then, and then came back somewhere in the 80s uh, and then worked as a scout into the mid, late 90s as well. It was kind of neat because when I got into the organization, everybody always talked about this because when you read it front to back, and he writes a lot, he's very verbose with it, but he basically describes what Troy Aikman became. It's pretty interesting. And this is actually on display. I forgot to take a picture of it, I apologize. But outside of our draft war room at the Star in Frisco, we have a, a display. I don't know if any of you guys have been there yet or not, but uh, where we have the draft book for Troy, Emmett Smith, and Michael Irvin cradled and open behind glass um, so you can see it. It's really, really neat to see those. That those binders were kept is, is pretty, pretty crazy. So all our draft evaluation binders from 1985 up through about 2014 before it all went digital only um, were kept. And the funny thing is everything prior to 1985 got shredded somewhere along the line, probably during the move from Central Expressway Tower to Valley Ranch in 1985, but they kept all the binders. So we had like five pallets of boxes of empty binders that were purchased in the 60s that still had like you know, the, the, the numbers on them, like 61, 62, they're all empty. I was like, ah, oh, this is terrible. Should have kept it, but um, I'll blame, I'll blame uh, Gil Brandt for that. I, I don't know who made that decision, but anyway, at least we have 85 up. Um, then we'll move on to the collections. So kind of gone over a lot of this already, but we'll keep, we'll keep going over it, I guess. Includes hundreds of thousands of physical and digital assets. Really, it's in the millions. The physical stuff's like hundreds of thousands. Um, so it's artifacts, memorabilia, moving image, still image, documents. Um, our film, we, to, we actually have exact numbers on our film now because we've item level cataloged every videotape and piece of film that we own um, and actually captured all the metadata ourselves because when you go to digitize and you send it to a vendor and they pick up a tape and it says Moose, our fans will know who Moose was. But they're going to be like, what is that? And then they put it in there, audition the tape, and, you know, was it a sterile Moose Johnston? Is it an interview? Is it game highlights? Is it um, him walking around that somebody's just taping because they thought it was funny? I, you know, who knows what it was? So we captured with our our department's expertise, all the metadata, so that whenever we digitize this stuff, put it into an access platform, um, that we can merge all that data in there and it's all right. Um, instead of every five seconds a vendor emailing me, hey, what is this? I'm going to send you a quick MP4 to look at and tell me what Moose is, and you know we don't have to deal. With, we won't have to deal with that. So we have it's about 365 miles of film. And the film we have is a lot of NFL films cans, but those have already been digitized by NFL films, and, and they have those. But we have all of our game film that we shot from 1960 preseason through 1986. 
Um, so this is our guys sitting up in the top of the stadium. And so it would be usually about six 400-foot reels per game. You have two for kicks and special teams, two for offense, two for defense. And then as time went on and, and you know, they'd start doing end zone, they have an end zone camera, a wide end zone camera, they'd have a wide sideline camera, they'd have one over the top. Starts uh, getting more and more. It's kind of neat because we have some of those games from the preseason of 1960, the very first games the Cowboys ever played as a franchise. And that was before NFL films. That was before anybody else. So as far as we know, those are the only copies of those games in existence. Now, they didn't play very good back then. I think we lost all those games. But, um, but just to see that, you know, the first team, the first games ever. Uh, so we're excited to get all those taken care of. Videotape, we're estimated over 70,000, approximately 10,000 hours of content, total run time. See, that's surprising. You got 70,000 tapes, but how much is on each one? That's what you're getting billed by, total run time. Um, so what we started finding is, you know, like all the, the tapes from Thousand Oaks training camp, pass rush drills in 1987, you know, like who cares, right? Um, it was like five minutes on. It'd be a 30-minute beta, beta SP tape. Um, but they didn't shoot like most people. They, you know, they run a play, cut, run a play, cut, run a play, cut to save tape. Tape is expensive. Um, so you have like five, even though they end up wasting 20 minutes or 25 minutes of tape anyway. Uh, but you'd have, um, you know, five minutes, even though that tape's 30 minutes. And we want to capture as much as possible so a vendor's not like, trying to bill you to, well, it's dead roll it make sure. I'm kind of speaking to anybody that is a librarian or archivist that has to deal with vendors. Um, they like to get a little tricky on the billing sometimes. Well, we want to make sure there's nothing else on it. There's nothing else on it, man. I know. I, I looked at it. I can tell you. I don't need you to sit and pay a guy to just watch black on a screen running, you know. So, so we've been very diligent to try to capture as much information about these assets on the front end as possible save us money, to be as accurate as possible, and, and make the whole process faster. So the, the, the videotapes comprise Dallas Cowboys TV and broadcasting, which came about in 1990. So these guys shoot all the games. Uh, they're the ones making all these shows, uh, the legend shows, all things seen online on, on uh, channel, what is it, CBS? or I can't remember exactly, because I got four kids, so I never get to watch TV. Um, <laughs> So I don't think I've ever even seen one of those shows in recent time. Um, training camps, practices, all the DCC cheerleading stuff, um, game tapes, et cetera, et cetera. All the B-roll footage, that's where a lot of this comes from, is all the B-roll footage. They're doing a special on Tony Dorsett. You know, over the years, they would interview him here and there and, and capture all these, you know, sit-down B-roll footage that they cut up and edit into a, you know, well-produced show. So we have all of that, too. That's where a lot of, there's about 40,000 of the tapes is B-roll stuff. And um, our artifacts, it's, it's everything you can imagine. Uniforms, equipment, awards, merchandise, Bill Parcells practice shorts that he used to wear. You know, like you name it. I found a box, this huge box that said Parcells. That's all it said. Open it up and it's all his khaki shorts and T-shirts. See him walking around the news at Valley Ranch, you know yelling at people, and I think that's what he was wearing. They kept all his clothes. I was surprised. Um, sorry, I'm running a little behind here, so we're trying to crank it up. Content, it's documents really every aspect. A lot of times when you come in in a corporate setting, it's like our, our items only really document this aspect of the business. Um, here it documents everything. All of our facilities, the players, executives, coaches, um, Game day, training camp, practice drafts, you, that's the stuff you would assume. Um, fans, events, publications, community, you know, what we do in the community through all these years. Um, it's all there. So kind of getting back to what do I do? What's our job? So I threw this in here. So this is actually Tom Landry's 1964 defensive playbook. We actually have his entire playbook library from 1960 up every offensive, defensive, quarterback manual, and his sideline cards, those bright pen-colored handwritten cards. You'd see him always with the fedora, and he's holding it over to the side. Uh, we have all those. 
And we have all of Jimmy Johnson's and Barry Switzer's and Jan Gailey's and Dave Campos and all the way up. So we have our entire history's playbook library, which is really cool. And one guy remembered, he thought we had him, uh, one of our people in football operations who's been with us a long time, because they ended up moving him out of Valley Ranch out to a shed. Well, we lovingly call it the shed. It was a building, but might as well have been a shed. Um, and they were all like up in the rafters, stored up, you know, all kinds of bugs and dust and everything else. But no one really knew that those were there. I don't, you know, you can't blame anybody. They, people turn over and it just kind of gets, hey, take all that stuff and put it somewhere, you know. So we found it and surprisingly they were all in great shape. Really no damage to anything. Um, so this is, Tom Landry invented the 4-3 flex defense. He was a defensive genius. And this is the first instance of his handwritten 4-3 flex defense found in his notes, playbooks, et cetera. So it's pretty, pretty cool um, to be able to look at that and, and still, everybody knows he invented it and all that stuff, but no one's really ever seen that, these pages right here, it's, it's pretty neat. So I geek out on stuff like that. It's, there we go. I think I'm jumping the gun because you're supposed to go one at a time, but so our, the expected plays for the archivists with the Cowboys would be knowing your history, being um, that corporate franchise memory. Um, even though I didn't go to the games in the 1960s and all that, but I wasn't at the Campbell Soup Company when they invented condensed soup in 1897 either, but I knew more about it than just about anybody. Um, I'm not a schematic football genius by any means, but knowing our history and our archives and and, and tell our story through the history is, is kind of the easier part for me. Uh, reference requests, internal, external. We are an internal working archive, but we service NFL films requests, Pro Football Hall of Fame, the league itself. Uh, case by case, people writing books, things like that, we'll, uh, we'll help them out if they're looking for images and things like that as best we can. Uh, when we have the time, we try to as best we can. Um, and then providing content, so um, providing content to the family, the league, all these things, broadcasting, social media. We see old photos of the draft, before draft on Instagram. They probably came from me. Um, public relations and networks, uh, curating displays, um, doing all our digital asset management, et cetera, et cetera. So it could be from, hey, Jerry wants to put pictures of such and such in his office, you know, make it happen. Um, or it could be, we need you to help decorate 90 acres at the star. Um, you know, curate some stuff. <laughs> so it, it gets, it's all over the place, all over the board. It could be, you know, and sometimes it's as easy as verifying facts, all that usual stuff. So, um, so our offensive playbook, first thing that came in was like, we've got to build some in-house capability. We have all these items, film, video, slides, negatives, prints. Um, we got to organize it all, and then we need to have the ability to access this stuff uh, and digitize it ourselves so that if we get requests, we don't look like we don't know what we're doing. Because nobody cares, like, do it, you need it, you know, get it done. So uh, we wanted to build some capability to digitize um, slides, negatives, uh, 35 millimeter and medium format, um, all the medium formats. Um, as well as, as our videotapes, et cetera, so that we could also start to show people, hey, I bet you didn't know we had this, you know, like, this is the kind of stuff we've got. We're going to start trying to get it accessible to you and your department so you can make better content and, and uh, b help build our brand better. So large-scale digitization initiatives is a huge thing we're working on. It's for, essentially for preservation first. It's that age-old thing here at every conference. Is it for preservation or is it for access? Well, it's both, and it's always both, because who cares if you have it if you don't ever use it? I mean, that don't shoot me. I know that's a, probably a, a sin to say that at some places, but in the corporate world, you better use it or no one's going to pay for it. Um, so we're doing our part to make sure we preserve it the right way to best practices, industry standards, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but making sure that we've got access to it for the people who are going to help make money with it and help build our brand and engage our fans with it. Um, you run into copyright issues? I mean, is that like an 
That is an AP wire photo, and we run into them all the time. Yeah, all the time. Um, our, most of the stuff that we shot, we owned. Um, I just put that in there because I knew everybody probably, or big fans would recognize. So that's the Hail Mary pass, Roger Staubach, 1975 to Drew Pearson. Um, and surprisingly, we didn't have a photographer there, I guess, because only photos we have of that game are AP. Um, our ultimate goals, long-term preservation of this unique history, making it accessible, whether it's a digital form or physical form, and collecting robust metadata. It doesn't matter if you don't know what it is, the provenance behind it. Um, and with things like, like lore and history that it's like, uh, you know, I lived in college with two cellists, and they're always talking about the, you know, Leonard Rose and Jacqueline Dupre, and she played the Davidoff cello, and, you know, who played that before her and played it after her. And, um, you know, that provenance to the instrument is just as important as how good the instrument actually is. It's, you know, um, that's a really important part of it. Like, this was, so we'll get to some things like, so this is practice jersey, right? Kind of stinks, it's dirty. But when you look at whose it was, all of a sudden that becomes, wow, this is one Jason Witten used. 2013, probably used it the whole practice because he's like that. He doesn't change jerseys and stuff very often. He usually wears the same couple. Um, that's my understanding anyway. Everything's wore off, the star's worn off. You know, it looks like garbage almost when you can. But but because of who it is and all that, you know. And let's see, 2013, so that was not the greatest season, not the greatest season, but it was leading into all that hard work led into 2014, right? Socks, man, we got a lot of socks. <laughs> so many socks, right? This looks like a sock, but when you turn over and it's Tony Romo's used sock, right? Grass still on it. So... You know, that, all of a sudden that sock becomes a hot item. You know, it's like, man, let me, let me touch the sock. Um, let's see. So, <laughs> so what we're trying to do all this for is um, this. I forgot to update this really, but um, we want to build our brand with, with all this, engage our fans. Um, and then when I first got in, it was like, hey, we're going to build a billion and a half dollar facility, and you're going to have to do a whole lot with that. Um, all of a sudden it was like, man, we got to figure out what we have and be able to get to it. Because when they want to do this or they want your recommendations on, how can, we, how can we display America's team on this wall? It's like, mm, geez, let me, you know, let me think about that for a little bit. Um, you need to know what do we have? What do we have to, to build a graphic or to build a, a physical display or whatever? Um, becomes very important. In the stadium, we opened the stadium club. You know, we used to have a stadium club in the end zone at Texas Stadium, and then we opened the stadium club at AT&T Stadium. And then I get a call, it's like, hey, we built some cases in there, we need to put stuff in it. I'm like, okay. We got to put it in. They're like, well, they need it in before the first preseason game. I was like, well, it's Wednesday. Can I do it? And I think the game was on a Saturday. And they were like, can I do it, like, tomorrow? And they're like, no, no, they're not even finished yet. What? Excuse me? They say, yeah, it's, there's not even paint in there yet. So I'm like, well, how about Friday? And he's like, no, I don't think it's going to work. I get a call at like 10 o'clock Saturday night. He's like, the paint's not quite dry, but it will be tomorrow. The games kicks off at 2, or it was like 3, and we need you out of here two hours before because they're going to open the restaurant. So I'm like driving underneath the stadium on a game day with all the crazy security at like 8 o'clock in the morning with all these boxes trying to go up freight elevators and, and like curate a restaurant, you know, like real quick. So it, knowing what we had was very important to go, let me just think, because we can always change it after this game, but they want it in there. So how do we represent ourselves the best in here and send me some, you know, engineers, schematics, the architects, renderings. and. So we did it real quick, you know, and it came out pretty good. Um, the funny thing is the same stuff still in there because we haven't really had a chance to get back to it, and we don't really know. And they want to do something different, but we, don't, we can't get anybody to define what is it you want it to look like. So we actually we, we've changed a few things out and added to it. Um, 
but we got to go back in there and, and redo that whole thing too. Um, don't tell anybody I report to. Um, no, they, I think it looks good though. I think it looks really good the way it is. Um, so our traditional side of things, we're collecting, organizing, preserving, controlling the climate, controlling security, keep an eye on all that, making sure everything's housed properly, everything's acid free that's touching it, putting stuff in mylar that needs to be in mylar. Um, you know, I got lucky when I was at North Texas, I got to, uh, I worked as, for the majority of my time as an audio and video preservation engineer, but I worked really closely with rare books and manuscripts and the folks there that, that taught preservation and special collections class. I got to work with them a lot, so I got to learn a lot about the physical side of preservation conservation, uh, which has really been helpful uh, for me. So I kind of loosely throw out things like stick it into mylar or throw it in a clamshell box, whatever. It's obviously a lot more important than that. It's just we got a lot to get through. And, and that's kind of what it comes down to sometimes is, is, is time. It's like do it right as best you can as quickly as you can. So documents. We've digitized over 2.5 million at this point. Um, I got a call from our director of PR about moving to the star. So we had a PR library at Valley Ranch. Wall to wall paper, binders, scrapbooks, filing cabinet drawers, every media clipping 1960 up through 2015. Um, they said, we're building another PR library at the star, but we don't want to put any paper in it. It's like, okay, all right. So you're like, we're going to build the same way, all the shelves, all the stuff, but no paper because we're going to have you basically curate it almost like a little museum kind of thing. And the whole point of the PR library is for external media people or Cowboys employees to be able to go in there and research, or writers. Um, and so like, so not, what they're essentially telling me is not only don't put any paper in there, but you got to find a better way to make it all accessible and searchable for our internal and external media people. So we started digitizing. Um, we started by digitizing all of our player contracts and medical records, and then all those draft evaluation binders, we did those too. Then we did every game program, flip card and stats. So PR had folders, a file folder for every game we've ever played. And each one had a flip card. This is Super Bowl 27's flip card. So this is what's up in the press box. And you wonder, how do they know the number and the player's name so fast? It's these that they study. So you've got, and this is September 16, 1990, Cowboys versus Giants, Texas Stadium. Um, you have the Cowboys roster, offense, defense, special teams broken down, and then the full um, alphabetical, and then by number, uh, by jersey number on here. So that's when they're up there and they see somebody pause a second, they're scanning if they don't already know the name. And then there'd be a program, so here's the program from it. These are all very well kept. So there's Bill Parcells in there. I thought this was kind of a, an interesting one. Um, so we scanned every program which people don't really look back at for research because everything that's in the media guide and all that's already, there. what's in here is kind of duplicated. But they have value, so I was like, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it all. And then every um, game summary, so it's the, the people up in the press box, it's the temperature, humidity, where it's at, the referees, this is the official scoring, so there's the handwritten final team statistics for the Giants, um, individual file statistics, individual final statistics on each player. Um, and so all this gets processed into, you know, a, a better form than this. But, and then the play-by-play -play typed, first and 10, New York 23 flag, New York minus 10 for holding more. So you got every single play. So these go back, the old handwritten type, mimeographed, all the old purple ones sitting in there. Um, and we have them going all the way through the 60 season, which is cool. Are you going to put um, the preseason ones online, the game books? So we have, um, yes, they are already. Oh, they are? Oh. They are. I thought it was only regular season or postseason. 
Oh, preseason. Yeah, I don't think they put the preseason on there because it's, it's just taking up data that they don't want to. Do you know about that portal? Sorry? Have you found our little portal? Yeah, the media. Yeah, we don't really advertise it, yeah. but it's, it's all public domain stuff, too. You know, it's like there's nothing in there that's proprietary. But this way, our media people can walk around wherever with their laptop, and I need this or I need that, and, you know, download a PDF of it real quick so they can research and do what they need to do, um, which I'm very proud of because that's, that's kind of the ultimate goal, you know. We, we got there with that. So every media guide, so here's one from 1961, a little small one. So I don't know if any of you have ever seen a media guide, but it's, um, actually, if you want to see our current one, you can go to DallasCowboys.com, team, media guide, 2017 media guide. There's more information. Now they're like this thick, and we still print them. I think we're one of the only teams that still prints them. Uh, we did again this year, uh, which I like. I like the physical one. I like to re I, it's harder for me to research the scrolling through a PDF of a thousand pages than just a book. Um, and then all our media clips, so it was like 400,000 pages of newspaper clippings, 1960 up. Um, and not only are they accessible now, but they're, they're keyword search. We OCR'd them all, and we're getting about 98% accuracy on them. Uh, only if one was on a copy machine and got really blurred out or cut off, uh, which is great. Because if you're looking for somebody, it makes it a lot easier. Um, team formation and historical documents, a lot of that we didn't even know we had. We kind of found through the move at Valley Ranch. And then all of our uh, Dallas Cowboys publications, every magazine, 1975, uh, well, actually, I guess through like 2016 until they were already born digital. Um, and here's a few examples. So this is that portal here. So every media guide's there by decade. You click on it, it downloads it for you. Um, this is Roger Staubach's rookie player contract, signed in 1965. You see Tech Schramm and Roger Staubach signed it. You know, he was, he was drafted early, but still had a Navy commitment. So he didn't actually start playing for us until 1969. Um, and what was it, $25,000? <laughs> I mean, I'd take $25,000 right now, but that's crazy to think. You look at salaries today, it's a, a lot of inflation there. So we did every contract as well. Um, so we use still images as an example. We, we've got 200, quarter million or so analog still images. But then we got all this born digital stuff, right? So we currently have and are managing 3.6 million digital images that were born digital. Um, and we amass about anywhere from 1,000 to 5,000 a, a, a week, a week, sorry. During the season, it's a week. Usually about two, three, four thousand 4,000 photos a week. Um, now we preserve these through having really sound migration strategies so we don't fall prey to format obsolescence, technology and hardware obsolescence, checking the bits, making sure checksums are run, make sure everything's backed up, um, centralizing and making it accessible and, and utilizing digital asset management tools uh, that help us keep tabs and everything. So these were born a few weeks ago at practice. That's Dak out at the star on the left and Dez up there. Yeah, it's funny, you watch him in practice, like, how come I don't ever see that in the game? You know, like, like look how crazy of a jump catch that is. They do that all day. It's, it's nuts. But I guess when you got another guy just as big as you, just as fast as you, on your back, you can't really, really make that happen as easily. But love, love Dak, love Dez, they're great. So we get, you know, thousands of images like this all the time that have to go somewhere. Um, and then, you know, our born digital stuff starts going back to like the turn of the century, 2001-ish. So these are born at Veteran Minicamp at Valley Ranch, 6'4", 2006. Anybody recognize anybody? See it. Parcells for sure. Yeah, T.O. Drew Bledsoe, number 11. Let's see. Oh, so, yeah, so this is Tony Romo's first year of catching the start later in the season when they set Bledsoe down and put him in. So we have a lot of that. So this is a lot of the kind of stuff that was living all over the place, all over the network. Or 
and binders and binders and binders of CD and DVD ROMs that no one even knew we still had that were the only copies of those years' photos that we had. So we're lucky we found them through the move. You know, you start turning over rocks, you'll find things. And so I had somebody working for me for like eight months just ripping data off of optical media and pushing it up to our digital asset management system. I'm sure she loves me for that. Uh, but I was like, wow, you know, people would ask, do you have a Romo from 2003? And it's like, no, we don't. And it's like, huh? Well, it's, they're somewhere. I know we have them. Maybe we just hadn't found them yet. And then we found them and, and got them up. So filling those, you know, those gaps was, was really felt good um, to bring that history back alive. So um, 200,000 plus still images. We've already talked through all that. It's every aspect of our history and time periods. So we have Jerry buying the team with Bomb Bright, and that's the old, uh, if anybody's curious, those old shots with that sign back there are the, the old team room at Valley Ranch is where they used to do press conferences. And then a hunt team huddled up at the Cotton Bowl in 1961. I love that shot. I think we used it in an elevator cab. Or we used it somewhere because it's just a really neat shot. Um, yeah, man. Hello. Here's some more images just for your visual enjoyment. We got Landry and Bob Lilly up here on the sideline. I love that shot. Um, one of Ron St. Angelo's triplet shots down here. We actually used, I can't remember if it was that one or a different one I picked behind the, for an art piece we did behind the concierge desk at the new Omni Frisco Hotel. Um, this one to the bottom right, if anybody can tell me what that is, I'll. I'll give you money I don't have in my pocket, but Calvin it is Calvin Hill. Yep, 1969. Kind of randomly came across this, and it was cool because we just found the slide in a box of like millions of slides thrown in it, and picked it up. And I was like, "Hey, that's Calvin Hill," and he still works for us. So he played under Landry and them in the 60s, 70s. He still works for us as a consultant. Really nice guy. I love the guy. And this was his first touchdown. And I printed it off and I saw him in the hallway. I was like, Mr. Hill, can you, do you remember this? And he goes, oh, yeah, that was my first touchdown. I was like, that's so cool, you know, like to show him that. I don't think he had ever seen that photo ever. Um, and then up here at the top right, it's a, a neat one I like because the defensive coach down there squatting down is Ernie Stockner, Hall of Famer, longtime defensive coach. Um, and there's so many great players here. You got Larry Cole, Hollywood Henderson, Harvey Martin. Cliff Harris, Charlie Waters, Randy Hughes, uh, Too Tall Jones, Randy White, they're, they're all in that one picture. It's, it's really cool. Film and video, man, sorry, I kind of had a little more redundancy in here than I realized on the film and video. It's all 16 millimeter, 60 through 86. Uh, the videotape kind of gone through. So this is a picture of a hallway that was our TV, broadcasting departments, tape library, and I couldn't even get all, that's about two-thirds of the room. I didn't want to go any farther back because it's cobwebs and it's nasty. And we had already pulled everything out of that room. I didn't want to get bit by a snake or something in there. So I kind of got as far back as I could, snapped the picture. And to the left, right through that door, is the TV studio. So they chucked gear in there. It was, it was kind of a mess in there. It was, it was um, but that's what we do. We clean up messes, and it's happy to be gainfully employed by cleaning up their mess. So it was no problem by me. And we spent a long time out there doing that. Um, DAMS, MAM, so Digital Asset Management, Media Asset Management Systems. Uh, we provide all of the digital asset management for our photography, still image assets, documents, uh, and soon to be for moving image as well. Uh, we administer that, not IT. We control permissions, usernames, passwords, technical problems, upgrading the systems. We kind of do all of that. Uh, we develop and implement the workflows with all of our content generators, videographers, photographers, all of that. Hey, make sure we get all this. We don't miss anything. That you name the files to this schema. You embed the IPTC metadata descriptions for the photographs. All that stuff, we capture it all. We collect it all. And you, you do all that, then I want you to put it over here, then we'll pick it up and put it over here forever, hopefully forever. Um, 
and it's been great because they've all been down to do that, so to speak, because they can't ever find their own stuff. So it's like, oh, you'll do that for us? I'm like, yeah, if you just name everything like this, put it over here, don't miss a beat, then we'll take care of the rest. And then when you need to look for your own stuff from two years ago, you can go find it. So they're very happy about that. Um, probably skip over some of that. So some of y'all might be wondering about the move. So the move from Valley Ranch, yeah, we ended up getting 31 years we were there. And as soon as I started working there, I knew we were going to be moving. So there's a lot of pre-capture of low-hanging fruit of stuff laying around that you know we need to keep that nobody, no department's going to take with them to Frisco, so we start hauling stuff out. But we were kind of put in charge of helping handle the move and the movers, but that's like, you know, you put all your stuff out of your cube and some boxes and they move it, but then every department had all these storage areas and, you know, it's like I had to push them, hey, go out there and take what you want, what you don't want, write shred on it or write my name on it and we'll go look and see if we really should shred it or not and we'll take it all out of there and everybody's more than happy to you know the corporate world they're not as onerous of junk you know it's like yeah please take care of that I don't want to mess with it so it, it took us we moved in August last year and my team we've kind of just now shut it all down out there with getting everything out a part of that is because we sat out in that tape library after everybody moved for like eight months, inventory and cataloging and capturing all the metadata for all those tapes. That took, we couldn't really do anything else but that for quite a while. Um, so it was about a year and a half of cleaning that whole place out. And then also finding stuff that we should take that nobody told us to take. You know, that's part of your job too, like tell them what you, you need to take. So, so we did take some lockers, some of the practice lockers out of the locker room. Um, and, you know, we, we took some of the, the pieces of the building and things that kind of tell that story. I even have some dirt and grass in a jar. Like, the players that ran across that dirt coming out of that. It sounds funny, but coming out of that weight room, locker room area, everybody from Herschel Walker on up, you know, ran right through there. So, yeah, we, just in case, you know, you never know, a little dirt. Um, so the star, I know time is probably getting way away from me, I apologize. Moved to the star August 2016, fabulous place, can't say enough good things about it. As nostalgic and stuff at Valley Ranch was, I'm, I'm glad we're here. It's, it's, it's amazing and what the Joneses did for us as employees to make a world class place to work. It's just, it's phenomenal what they're doing for the public the citizens and fans is, is really great. And I have a 14 year old in high school, and she marches at Lone Star High School Band in Frisco. And it's really neat to see her come to my job and march on the field out there. It's really, really pretty neat. Um, so the star, we had integral involvement, design, obviously Charlotte Jones Anderson, our chief brand officer. This is her baby. She's one of the design, style, I, I can't hold a candle even 100 miles from her. She, she's unbelievable, unbelievably talented, so much fun to work with, and her, her ability to, to look at a wall and transform it into what it should look like is, is just, I don't even know how to describe it. It's amazing. So it was really great working with her, helping come up with ideas and helping support, give us the stuff we need to, to make it all come alive. So all the heritage branding, uh, telling our history and stories. So instead of, she's never wanted to have just a museum like a Hall of Fame. You go to Green Bay, pay your money, you walk through a, a museum. That's cool. But she wanted, we had 90 acres, and she wanted it cowboys through and through, the whole 90, even on the sidewalks. We have a Ring of Honor deal on the sidewalks. The huddle sculpture that's out there now, the, the, uh, the metal images uh, that we did on the sides of the parking garages. And a lot of it's subtly branded cowboys. You know, we, we decorated through and through the Omni Hotel. Baylor Scott and White's going to have a lot of cowboys branding. And, and making it fit those venues is, is really neat to be able to, to do that. Um, got ahead of myself. Um, so it's our headquarters, the Omni Hotel, Baylor Scott and White, the restaurants and retail, the Ford Center. We've got stuff everywhere. 
Um, it's really neat because it's done so well. I thought I'd show you all a few photos. Most of this stuff is on the tour if you ever go do the tour, but this is the new PR library. So all of those, all of this was filing cabinets with player clips and stuff, and all the shelves were binders. And the table in the center is actually the original executive conference room table that they put in Valley Ranch when they opened it. So that's been used since 1985 by all the Cowboys execs to make all the decisions. Uh, and I used to get to go to meetings and sit around that table at Valley Ranch. It's pretty neat. There's a big inlaid, wood inlaid star in the center of it. It's kind of hard to see. So we used all you know, memorabilia, books, merchandise, all kinds of things to basically decorate this. And it's great. NFL films them love it because they love to shoot content for their shows in here because you get, a, get them behind those little replica trophies or somewhere and get a real tight shot with some of that stuff behind them. Uh, it's really, uh, it, it serves a lot of purpose. And all our media guys, newspaper and TV guys, they, they'll have meetings in there and stuff as well. We had two practice suites. We had a practice suite at Valley Ranch. We did two. So this is, we had a Ring of Honor themed and a Hall of Fame themed. So we decorated this out. Every Ring of Honor member is represented one way or another uh, in this. A lot of autographed stuff by those guys. You got Chuck Howe uniform, game used Larry Allen, game used Troy Aikman jerseys. Um, all kinds of neat stuff. The Hall of Fame, and we just used this photo. So Bob Lilly, our first Hall of Famer in 1980, that's an AP image that they allowed us to use uh, with permission and wrapped it on the glass, printed on glass around that. Pretty neat. That really embodies a lot in that photograph. It's one of my favorite photographs. Um, this is our knuckle staircase. If you do the tour, it's by the numerology wall. You get to walk around the staircase. It goes three floors. And what we did was we, frame by frame, did the Hail Mary pass from Staubach to Pearson all the way up and down. So when you're going down, you see Staubach throwing it all the way down to Pearson, catching it and running in. And then if you go up, you kind of go backwards. It came out really, came out really good. I wasn't quite sure how it was going to be when we first decided to do it. but. Uh, it really came out amazing. It's such a the signature play of the Cowboys. Valley Ranch just had all our team photos on the wall, silver frames. It looked good, but we decided to to make it more expandable and do it a little better. So we we came up with this design. We we made them all black and white, and they're actually all color. But we did them all black and white. Picked a hero image that embodied that decade. So that Dandy Don over here and. Landry with his two Super Bowl wins and, you know, um, obviously triplets in the 90s and that kind of thing. Um, and, and so it goes all the way to now and then there's room to, to keep growing that. Um, let's see what else we got. The Nike sponsored Star Walk. Uh, we did this, the link this hallway, we picked our top 10 moments in Cowboys history and created this custom, it's not really wallpaper, but kind of wallpaper with these big duotoned hero images in it. So there's kind of like a big background and then a foreground hero image and then um, acrylic numbers and letters telling each moment uh, throughout here. So that's Super Bowl VI from 71. That's the first one there. And then the middle, they wanted to do something. So we did the uniform display. A lot of you probably seen the media because they love shooting it. So I did this whole thing and it was sounded easy. And it wasn't, because we want to keep it as authentic as possible. Um, so actually, all these cleats down here that go up through Staubach are 60 and 70 era Rydell cleats that were made out of kangaroo leather. And those are real ones. They're not replicas, actual cleats that we had. Most of these jerseys are authentic. A couple of them aren't. We had a reproduction Staubach jersey, and it was made wrong for the decade. It was not mesh. It was like a knit. And so we had to have that remade. There's only like one place you can go to have that done right, people that actually make the jerseys for the league. Uh, and then cutting the stripe off. You know, as most Staubach photos, when he was young, he had two stripes, and then his career went on, he had one stripe. And I was like, man, that's weird. I wonder why that is. And I finally found out that it's because he had a bad elbow hitting the ground all the time. And so he liked to cut that, he would cut that stripe off so it wouldn't be touching his arm and his elbow. So to be as authentic as we could, we did it in 1976 
with the bicentennial helmet, we did we can we had them only do one stripe. Um, the socks are authentic from Troy Aikman up. All these socks, I didn't have Don Meredith socks, and and we didn't have socks for the silver anniversary, 1984, because these are blue white stripe with a silver stripe in the white. I'm like, I gotta have socks made. So I called Twin City Knitting, the people that make all the socks for the NFL since the 50s. And they're like, man, I think we still have some of the templates for these things <laughs> from those eras. So I called them, I'm like, I need socks. I did all this photo research, because what we figured out is, like, Bullet Bob Hayes here, and that era in the 60s and 70s, the sock design was different by position. So a defensive back socks had different stripe patterns than a wide receiver. So we had to actually go back for those specific years and make sure we got the design exactly right for that position. So we try to do it as authentic as possible. So socks, like that's why I have partial of socks. Socks took up like seven weeks of my life <laughs> for a while there. It, like it had to get done, you know, it had to get done. Um, and they were surprisingly affordable. Like, send me the bill and it's like 250 bucks. I'm like, this is awesome. They get socks more often. And, you know, it makes sure you get two pairs made, not just one, in case something happens. So, This is one of those lockers from our original practice facility that we installed at the Omni Hotel and the restaurant, Neighborhood Services. And it is enclosed, and this is why we were actually installing it the day it opened. Uh, it's enclosed in plexi and all that, but we took Bob Lilly's original game used shoulder pads, thigh pads, and knee pads. Tony Dorsett's game used early 80s game used pants. Roger Staubach uniform, a pair of those repro socks from a defensive back. A ball signed by six of our Hall of Famers Bob Lilly, Randy White, those guys. And then up here, there's like earpieces and mouthpieces and. Um, stuff we got to put a helmet in there too that's coming uh, so what we wanted to do is have one of those lockers original one that span spun those decades with the top players from those decades stuff dressed out in it like you would have seen uh, at that facility we actually researched a lot of photos from that practice facility that bob bruning and a few other people lent us to see what if you walked in any one day back there in the 70s what did those lockers look like what was in them um, and this is as close as we could get. So I thought that was a really neat um, way to utilize some of your artifacts in a really neat way. And then if you're sitting in the booth looking down the windows, you see that Staubach jersey hanging in it. Um, so there's a lot of exciting challenges. We deal with project management and consulting, enterprise-wide, department-wise. Um, I think we've touched on all of this. It's a real balancing act. You know, you're retroactively archiving all this stuff. You're, you're knowing what you do have while you're trying to know everything you have while you're still discovering it. Um, trying to capture everything generated today and then develop those systems and processes for it to, to be easy to do. Uh, and then strategize and implementing the enterprise systems to deal with all of it um, while providing traditional reference services, archiving, library, preservation, conservation, research services to everybody. Um, it gets kind of crazy, but it's, it's really interesting. It's a lot of fun because there's a lot of opportunity uh, to make a difference to, to, and also elevate the awareness of archiving, you know, um, librarianship, things like that that are kind of, you know, losing traction in modern society and, and we're it gets kind of scary. So I, I like for people to see, yeah, cowboys have an archivist. It's not that boring, all right? You know, like it's, this is an exciting field here, even though you may not have even heard of it because there's not that many of us around. Um, so anyway, that's, um, that's what I've got, and I hope you enjoyed it. And I'd be happy to take any questions if there's time. I, I probably went way over. I, I talk a lot. Okay, cool.